Um, Jim was, uh, was very kind in his introduction. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today um, is, is really not about uh, myself. Um, in many ways, this case uh, is, is really not about me. So there are some people here, and I, I can't uh, identify them, who participated in, the, in this case. And um, this case is about everybody that uh, took part. Big cases, many people. And there were many people uh, in, in this case. And the case is really about what happens. What happens when, as uh, we found out in this case, when all of a sudden in uh, 1985, we start to receive information that the Soviets are receiving American secrets. And so the question is, what secrets? How many? Where are they? What kind? How often? Are they coming from one location, many locations? And the, there, so there's, there's a thousand questions, but there's no one to answer. We know from the source that we had that's reporting on this that it looks like it's coming out of Europe. Okay? Europe is pretty big. <laughs> You know, and it's like, okay, thank you for the information, but could you provide us with a little bit more? Uh, no. <laughs> no. But over time, <clears throat> U.S. Army, or the CIA, develops more information. And we come to realize that the information is being vectored to the Soviet Union through Hungary. The Hungarian intelligence service is, to a great extent, um, parlaying this, this, this information. And the uh, uh, documents appear to be, because no one has the documents in front of them, the documents appear to be uh, U.S. Army primarily. So in the aggregate, they're, they're primarily from the Army, but they also have Air Force documents. They also have documents from um, other military services from, from other countries. The case is turned over to the United States uh, Army uh, INSCOM, uh, U.S. Army Security Command, Intelligence and Security Command. And um, if you know somebody from, from INSCOM, uh, shake their hand because they did something that is truly heroic. They were able to sift to, through 250,000 soldiers and identify one. Now, just think about that. That's not even a needle in a haystack. You know, if you've got a needle in a haystack, you just grab a magnet and you'll find the needle. This is, this is beyond extraordinary. Because, you know, keep in mind, this is the 1980s. We have all these military bases overseas. We don't know where the secrets are, are coming from. And yet, they're able to reduce it to one person. And it's about that time that the FBI uh, be becomes involved. And, uh, and I know nothing about this. I, I don't know anything about this case because I was happy and uh, working other matters uh, while in Tampa, Florida. They determined that the secrets are most likely coming out of the 8th ID, 8th Infantry Division mechanized out of Germany at, at uh, Bad Kreuznach. And um, they were eventually able to, I, uh, this is a, a picture of the base. Um, I think about 10 years ago, the base was demolished. It's now been turned over to the, the Germans. But this is where um, we were based. And uh, was anybody here from that knows this base personally? Um, they came up with the name of Clyde Lee Conrad. 
an individual who had been on the base for a very long time, had not transferred out, had access to classified uh, material. They mount an investigation and it focuses on him. And within a short period of time, they identify a friend of his who was uh, a native-born Hungarian, had served in the US military, had served in Vietnam, was awarded medals in Vietnam. But there's something weird going on. They're seen together far too often. They do a really exemplary investigation. And eventually, they um, determine that they are acting, cooperating with two doctors who are both Hungarian but living in, Germ in uh, Sweden. And the doctors are, in fact, carrying the classified documents across the borders. Not very sophisticated. Doctors, nobody bothers them. They have their little bag. You put secrets in there. Who's going to look inside and, and, uh, and so forth? So this goes on, and uh, Conrad is arrested. That day, a worldwide message goes out to the FBI. And this is something that the, the FBI is very good at. And they said, find and locate an individual by, uh, well, it, the worldwide message was, find everybody that was stationed at the 8th ID and talk to them and see what they know about Clyde Lee Conrad and what was going on at the base. I was uh, in Tampa, Florida at the time, and the case agent that was going to get this case was on vacation. And so at 8.15 in the morning, I get a piece of paper that says, find and locate Roderick Ramsey and just talk to him about what was Germany like? Did he know Clyde Lee Conrad, any information at all? And this is where I was talking about that it's really not about any one person. It's about the things that you encounter. And that morning, I was actually scheduled to fly surveillance. And uh, some of you from Tampa remember that. And um, so I was like, OK, I've got to drop that to now do this. And um, someone from the Army comes over to me and, and says, I'm, I'm assigned to go out with you. And, uh, and locate and talk to this individual. I know nothing of the case. So we go out, we locate him, and uh, we find him at a trailer park. And what was interesting about this individual is that while we were talking to him, and you'll see other details in, in, in the book, uh, one of them is, and it's something the FBI doesn't prepare for you, prepare you for at the academy, is when we get to knock on the door, he's naked. <laughs> I'm just not prepared at 8.15 in the morning to do an interview with somebody that's just naked. <laughs> it's, they don't teach that. They don't, it's, maybe they do now, I don't know, but it, it, it wasn't then. It was just very difficult. But uh, so anyway, he gets, uh, he gets dressed and, uh, and we start talking to him. And um, as Jim said, I, I had been studying nonverbal communications, what the public calls body language for, for a long time. And one of the interesting things that happened was, is as we were talking about Germany, uh, and uh, he was very uh, excited and he was very communicative. But the minute we asked about Clyde Lee Conrad, he was smoking a cigarette and his cigarette shook. And I thought to myself, why would a cigarette shake at the mention of, of a name? Now, keep in mind, not all words have the same weight. This is something our parents don't teach us, but they don't. For a killer, if you've killed someone with an ice pick, gun has no significance. Knife has no significance. The only thing that has significance is the ice pick. And so his cigarette shook, and I thought, well, that's odd, but let's be scientific about it. So we talked about other things, and then we mentioned the name again, Clyde Lee Conrad. 
the cigarette shakes again. Well, in the FBI, we call that a clue <laughs> that, that something is amiss. Something is not right here. Doesn't say he's lying, but there's something that's causing this auto arousal that um, is indicative of some sort of psychological discomfort. We do that one more time. And, um, and so now I'm pretty convinced there's, there's something going on here. Meanwhile, what's interesting is my partner, who is busy looking at the notes, and, and all of you who are future investigators, I don't know, we have one here, maybe there's others here, put the notes down, pay attention to your suspect. <laughs> your suspects are talking to you both verbally and non-verbally. This guy was talking to us non-verbally. And uh, the minute we mentioned this, the uh, Conrad, he, he, you could tell something was at issue. So we go off and uh, we continue the interviews um, at a hotel because it's going to take some time. And um, by this time, I'm pretty convinced there's, there's something at issue here. When I got back to the office, and uh, there's, there's another fellow here that is very familiar with this. I went to my supervisor and I said, look, I don't know anything about this case, but I'd like to open up an investigation on Rod Ramsey. And he says, based on what? And I said, his cigarette shook. <laughs> and I'll never forget it. He, he, he said, what? <laughs> He says, I'm going to lose my career over a shaking cigarette. Can you imagine me before Congress testifying that we opened an investigation because the cigarette shook? And I said, I, I think there's something to this. And uh, what was interesting was that in this investigation that had taken place prior to this, um, there was really no indication that, that Ramsey was, was involved in, in any way. To us, he was just a, another witness. So my supervisor said, I'll tell you what, let's, let's not open a big investigation. How about you just go out and talk to him tomorrow? And, and so began a process. And, and, it's, a, and it's, a process that, <laughs> it's a process that you just never know how long it's going to take. And um, as, as you'll see fr from the book, um, what we thought would only take a few minutes or a few days lasted 10 years. 10 years. And it's just unimaginable. If somebody had come to me and said, you're going to be investigating one guy for 10 years, I would have said, no, no, I got better things to do. But that's, that's what happened. So we began to focus on Ramsey, who um, was, you know, you think of somebody that's involved in espionage, but he's a cab driver. He's driving a cab. He really isn't making very much money. Um, most of the time, he's in the parking lot. He's not really driving a lot of people, and he's living a, a life that um, is nothing really to aspire for. Because as I later learned, he hardly ever had any money. We began to look at him, and we began the process uh, with one of our great analysts, uh, Mark Reeser. We began to talk to him. Just talk to him. And the theory was this. Rather than go for a confession, let's go for 100 admissions. If we can get him to admit little things. So the first one was, how much was he spending? So and it's an interesting thing. He, they, most people would probably never talk about something bad they've done. But he was very proud to talk about how much money he, he was spending in Germany on drugs. Yeah, it's like, I would keep that secret. But <laughs> not that I ever would do that. But, but, but he was just. You know, I guess if he has to reveal one thing or another, this one is, is more palatable. And he begins to detail a life where pretty much there were no anchors. He was susceptible to anything at any time, prostitution, 
selling cigarettes on the black market. I guess at, at the time in Germany, you could sell coupons for uh, gasoline, much, uh, much less expensive on, from the base and so forth. All this is going on. And he's slowly revealing that he's spending more money than the $86 a week that he's making as a soldier. And this continues. So over a period of a year, we interviewed him 42 times. He's not under arrest. The shortest interview, I think, was around three hours. The longest one was, was around 12. Now, you, you're saying, why would, you, why would it take that much? Right? A bank robber. <laughs> Did you do it? OK, you're going to jail. Here's the problem. All the evidence was in Russia. And the Soviets were not going to cooperate. They just seemed disinclined to help us in any way, which is hard to believe. All the evidence is overseas. There is no evidence at the base. Clyde Conrad is not talking. The Germans are very helpful. But they're unwilling to testify in the United States. Zoltan Zabo can't be located. The Kerchik brothers in Sweden, they're beginning to chirp, talk. But here's the problem. How do you introduce, they don't want to come and testify in the United States. You can't enter hearsay evidence in the United States. So they might as well not be talking. This is a huge, huge issue. So the process continues for a very, very long time. Now here's the other part of the problem. That guy had the second highest score, second highest score on the Army intelligence test ever taken. His IQ is off the charts. You know, we looked into that and we said, well, you know, like, you know, how uh, they, there comes a point, and I didn't know this, where it's just no longer measurable. It's like he's having a, his own little Mensa meetings in his own head. <laughs> it's, it's just off the charts. It can no longer be measured. And so the interviews w with him, you know, we, we had to approach them as what are we going to talk about each day? Because this is an individual who, you know, we can't force him to, to talk to us. We, we have to make it comfortable enough to where he's willing to talk to us. But there are days when he wants to talk about the Byzantine period. Or he wants to talk about the Ottoman Turks and, uh, and uh, you know, what happened in uh, Jerusalem. Or, any number of esoteric topics. I, and I mean any number of them. One day he got into numbers theory. And then the, other, the next day he got into, um, I mean, the, it, it was just keeping up with him. It, one day, I, I, I have to tell you, after about an eight hour interview, I got up and my partner says to me, he went to the, to the restroom and he says, did you spill your Coke on you? And I said, no, why? And she says, your whole backside is wet. And that was my brain trying to keep up with him. It was like sprinting in the mind to, to stay one step ahead because the other issue was we weren't, we weren't allowed to record the conversation. And so, and we weren't taking notes in front of him. And the reason we weren't taking notes is because we knew it would have a chilling effect. Legal notepad is legal. <laughs> this no longer becomes a free-flowing conversation. And so, it, it's, it, I can tell you that, you know, when I talk about it's the effect that these cases have on us, um, it was, it was very, very daunting. But over time, 
he was able to connect some of the dots that we knew and he eventually confessed. And he confessed to something that nobody knew about. He confessed that Clyde Conrad had recruited him and that together they had not just stolen secret documents, but so many documents that they actually had to be carried out in a duffel bag and it, it was measured in weight. And we determined through experiments that this duffel bag must have weighed close to 300 pounds because it required three military guys to carry it. Well, you know, so we started to ponder, my, my, my great analyst, uh, Mr. Reeser, says, well, wait a minute, where are they carrying these documents? If you're carrying this much out, and I have to tell you, both Ramsey and the guy that recruited him, Conrad, were the base librarians. They were the librarians for the classified documents. So these guys were the, the people that were entrusted to protect this stuff. They were stealing it. So we start to, to ponder this, well, you know, wow, hmm, a lot of secrets going out, but I mean, surely you're not delivering all this poundage all at once. So while having a cigarette, how many of you, just raise your hand, have been to Disney World? Well, just down the street, Embassy Suites, room 316 on International Drive. That's where all the interviews took place. He's having a cigarette and he says, oh yeah, well, we rented a secret apartment. What? What do you mean you rented a secret apartment? He says, yeah, we had an apartment. Well, we had to store the stuff. Now, I know some of you are real aficionados here of, of espionage. Go back and try and find in history where someone has had to rent an apartment to store that much classified equipment. And not just store it, but it was at least between ankle and knee high in classified materials. I go, Rod, I mean, you guys must have been really busy. And he said, yeah, we had to find an alternate way to, to transport the information. Okay, you're the brainiac. How'd you do that? One of the things that's great is narcissistic people like to brag. <laughs> and he did. And he says, well, I came up with an idea. I would take a, a Disney movie, right? Cinderella or whatever, and then halfway through, we would put little pieces of tape on the back, and then we would record the secret documents, 1001, 1002, 1003, 1000, and if anybody intercepted the VHS, there was a VHS system, someday your parents will explain <laughs> this to you. If it was intercepted at the border, it was brilliant. They're going to look at it and say, oh, it's a Disney film. But this is 1985. Who had VHS players? Not anybody in government. Not in any government. And guess what? It's a different system over there. So even if they had it, it still wouldn't play. And so that's how they took the documents over. Thousands and thousands thousands of, of pages. Well, we, uh, we came back to, uh, to uh, obviously, we have to prove this. We have to prove that there was a secret apartment. You can't, as you know, in the United States, if a person confesses of a homicide, it's nothing. You have to prove it. Confession means nothing. So how do we do this? Well, there wasn't Google Earth at the time. So we, we, we sent uh, to, our, um, to our friends uh, up here in Washington, and for some reason, the best they can do is come up with a tourist map of uh, Bad Kreuznach, and, uh, and it's 10 or 12 years old, 
and we said, okay, this, this isn't going to cut it. This isn't going to cut it. So our, our friends uh, in, at the embassy were able to get us a, uh, a digital map, or not a digital map, but a road map from the people that fix roads in Germany, and we were able to blow it up. So now we sit down with Rod and we say, okay, can you find the apartment? He says, well, you know, I didn't know the address. It was at night. We would walk there. And um, so we try to find it. And of course, and I know you're going to find this hard to believe, <coughs> nobody at headquarters believed us. <laughs> they said, this doesn't exist. There is no secret apartment. This is he's pulling your leg. We, we, you know, we know everything about espionage. We've never had anything like that. The Germans come back and say, this is very unlikely. We've investigated this case thoroughly, and no one ever mentioned uh, an apartment. Okay. Long story short, and you'll, you'll see it in the book, we finally get a decent enough map. Rod looks at it, and he says, it's right there. I said, come on, Rod. The Germans are going to laugh at us if you're wrong. So the, the uh, Bundeskriminalamt in Germany drives out, and uh, they're driving in the neighborhood. And they find an old man raking, right? And they're in there in an undercover car. So, but the, the man approaches them, and he says, this is how undercover they were. He says, you must be the police. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the old joke. How can you tell an FBI agent's undercover? His tie is removed, right? And uh, he says, I knew you would come here. And, he said, and the officer said, what do you mean? And he says, I rented the apartment to the spot you arrested. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Here we go. What was in the secret apartment? Well, everything from secret to top secret to um, Things dealing with atomic, top secret. I can't give you the, the, the code word for that. And then these little strips that had holes in it that are used for communications, top secret communications. And this just gets worse and worse and worse. And um, you know, still there's a lot of people that are discrediting how much uh, of this information is is uh, going out and so forth. And this process is ongoing, ongoing. And at the same time, I know you'll also find this hard to believe, there are leaks. <laughs> there are leaks coming out of Washington <laughs> that there's an investigation going on and that it's focusing on, on, on different people. And so we are, at, uh, we are having a battle between what we're supposed to do and th these other forces uh, that are going on. But nothing was as, uh, let me see if I, if I have, a, there's another one of, uh, of him. Oh, one of the places they would, they would meet in Germany is at, at a Wienerwald. Uh, and uh, I always think of James Bond where he meets and they have cocktails. These clowns are meeting at Wienerwald. I mean, Hot dogs were $1.99, I think. But as the investigation progresses and, you know, people want more and more details, more and more details. Now the Pentagon is involved. NSA is involved. CIA is involved. All the services are involved and all the services overseas are involved because they have equities. They have interests in all of this. The Swedes, the Germans, the Brits, the Italians. I mean, this is, you know, this is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I, don't, I won't go into all the details because obviously you're here, you're going to be looking at the book. But there comes a point in the investigation where Rod says something that was beyond jaw-dropping. And this is something that even the investigators that had been working this already since the 
early 80s, had no idea. And that's because the original source never had access to everything that they had given away. And that everything that they had given away was not held in the same place. One day, we're, I'm talking to Rod, and he says, oh, yeah, we also gave away the pals and the cookies. I'm thinking, okay, downstairs they serve cookies. These are not what he's talking about. And I said, okay. The other thing is, if you ever want a narcissist to talk, just play dumb because they think they know everything. And I didn't know everything, so this was actually a good combination. He says, well, yeah, the permissive action links. And I said, well, what are those? And so he begins to tell me. Permission, the permissive action links were the last security on nuclear devices. And you have to remember, this is 1980s, Germany was prepared to use nuclear satchels on its own soil prevent Russian tanks from coming across the pull the pass. They'd had that little unpleasant experience back during World War II, and they weren't going to have Russians on German soil ever again. And frankly, I can't blame them. So they were prepared to use these nuclear devices as mines to prevent this from happening. <coughs> Ramsey gave those away but then it gets worse. And this is when things, you, you know that it can't get worse because then he drops the big stink bomb on us and he says, I stole the nuclear go codes. Yeah, and I had the same reaction. I stopped breathing. You stopped breathing because what? He says, yeah. I got into the emergency action center and I clipped the go codes. Now, this is being televised, so I'm not going to get into a lot of details here. But when you have th these devices and you know what they're made out of, you know how they're designed, and you know how the, the tree of action works, you can replicate it. What if you were to insert it at a high enough level? Then you have what's called nuclear stand down. The order goes out, but it doesn't go anywhere. That's when things really, really got really bad. And that's when we started to say, OK, you know what? We've been talking to this guy for a year. We don't have all the evidence. We've got to take him down. We've got to, we're going to testify in Germany. I had to go to testify in Germany at, at Clyde's trial. This, uh, this cannot go on. <coughs> and uh, I'll close this with this, and then we'll open it up to, to, to questions, because I, I know a lot of you came here to, to, to ask questions. We finally arrested Rod and, uh, in Tampa. My, my good friends, uh, the Hogs were there. Uh, and, um, and then we had to do the damage assessment. And somebody had to testify to the totality of the damage. So we got the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe to do the damage assessment. And this is what should make you take pause. In the German trial, the German judge said, had hostilities broken out with the Soviet Union, Germany had two choices, total capitulation or the use of nuclear weapons on their own soil. Go to a map and look at the Fulda Pass and look at how many cities and villages are on the Fulda Pass. They would have had to nuke all of them to prevent the 42,000 tanks from, from suddenly coming. That wasn't the worst. Supreme, uh, General Otis looked at the, the totality of the damage, and he said this. Had, 
hostilities broken out, the defeat of the West would have been assured. And that appears in no other espionage case in American history anywhere. We have had CIA officers killed, assets killed, human sources killed. We have had communications betrayed. But we have never had a damage assessment that said the defeat of the West would have been assured. And so in the end, this was the secret apartment. This is the last day of Conrad as a, as a, at trial. Ramsey was arrested. And he gave us two other individuals. And I'll, I'll share this with you, because I know, Amanda, you wanted me to talk about body language. So Rod Ramsey wouldn't give us the names of the people that he got involved. So we did a trick. I'll use that word for you, young man. We did a trick. We wrote down on three by five cards, little cards. I was in a class the other day, and my students, college students, didn't know what a three by five card was. <laughs> because it, they, this is a true story. They all use iPads. On each three by five card, which Mr. Reeser helped me to put together, we put the name of everybody that would have had access. And then I just flashed them in front of him. And his pupils constricted on two, and only two, on these two guys out of 32. And so we went out and talked to them. And after several interviews, they confessed to espionage. You see, when we don't like things, our pupils constrict. When we like them, they dilate. And that's how you select your loved ones. And eventually, we arrested um, Kelly Church as, as a result of this. Total of nine people went to prison. Ten years. And that was it. That's what happened on a Tuesday afternoon or morning when I was <laughs> lucky enough to be the man on call when the case agent, who was really competent, and I wish she had taken this case from me, uh, did it, and, and that's it. That's that's it. So now we'll open it up to uh, to, to questions. How are you, Joe? <laughs> it's good to see you. Any uh, any question at, at, at all? Right here. Y yes, sir. Thank you. Um, why was Ramsey so cooperative from the beginning? The way you tell the story, anyway. I mean, was he under? He didn't get arrested yeah. for a while. That's a great question. It wasn't. It, you know. For Rod, it was a game. To, to a certain extent, he has a lot of the traits of uh, sociopathy. Uh, very narcissistic, very manipulative. And he thought that he could manipulate uh, or talk his way out of anything. The problem was that as he talked, he had to reveal something. And he wasn't sure what I was, if I had said to him, how much money were you paid? He would have never told me. But by asking him, well, you know, how much was milk? How much was sugar? How much were the, the, uh, the ladies of the evening? And, and so forth, we were able to get an accountant to look at it. And, he, and you know, he's spending $1,100 a week. <laughs> but he's only, you know, earning uh, 68 or $86. So, it was, it was by that method, and then just, just listening to him. Um, and I think, he, obviously, he knew he was under investigation. He knew I was an FBI agent. Um, I just really think that he could talk his way out of it, because he had done this his whole life. Yeah, that's good. good. Yes, sir. Please wait, Robert. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because they're, they're recording it, so yeah. Yeah, you mentioned he was a librarian in the military, but what was his military occupation specialty? Yeah, it's, you know, that was so long ago, I really don't, don't remember. But I mean, he was, uh, what was it, E4? And, um, and it was just um, the shop, with, with, which was G2 Plans, 
was really just the, the, the handling of classified uh, plans. Um, so you had the, uh, you know, um, Op Plan 33001, which was the general go to war plan and all these other plans and the updates and they did the military walks. Um, what's interesting is, is when we did the accounting of these documents, uh, General Colin Powell had just left in 85. He had access to the same documents that the theater commander had because these copies were being shared among all these, all these folks. So he was actually looking at the same copies, and the Russians were looking at the same copies of our, uh, went, uh, you know, our nuclear uh, um, uh, test, or not test, but the, um, the, uh, the fake war plans that they, that they do to, uh, um, to you know, what happens if, if something happens. I, I forget the names. But they're looking at all this stuff almost in real time, almost in real time. And, uh, and it was, uh, let me tell you, the, 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 the Pentagon was not very happy because they were, you know, you realize it's the human factor. When you look at leaks nowadays, it's always, you know, the human factor. It's, if, if you have someone flawed of character at the right place, you know, they can release everything. And, you know, and back then, these guys would spend hours and hours with a 35 millimeter camera focusing, taking pictures. Think of it now, where you can download a terabyte of information. And uh, it's, uh, it's very frightening. Why hadn't he done more after this brilliant espionage career and then he's driving a cab? Was there? That's, Amanda, that's a great question. You know, all told, he probably uh, earned less than seventeen thousand uh, dollars in the three years that he, that he was involved. I think it has a lot to do with the fact that he's an individual that was used to taking shortcuts. Espionage was easy. Getting a college education is hard. F you know, having a focused life, mastering your life is hard. Doing this sort of thing was uh, was, was easy, and uh, and uh, he's uh, his whole life had been like that. It's uh, the, there's a, I think there's a French word that describes it, manque. It's a, he never really quite achieves anything. He tries, but but he doesn't. Sir, oh, hang on. There's <laughs> um, why for all of the uh, the knee deep material that he accrued, and then trans uh, re copied it and transmitted on. Did he leave all this evidence behind? I mean, it's just, it, you know, borders on ridiculous. Well, it was a, that's a great question. I, I misspoke. We never found that evidence. It was parceled out. What they did was they, they turned into espionage or us. So they would take the same document and sell it to the Hungarians and then they would replicate it and sell it to the Czechs, the Czech intelligence service. And so now they're double dipping. And um, the, you know, they had secret, from there, once they had been able to digitize it in, in this sort of primitive way, then they were able to get rid of the material. And then the intent was to parcel it out over time to the different services to increase its, uh, to increase its, its value. Any, uh, oh, there's a question right there. Hang on a second. The, the, uh, the young lady in the fourth row was first. And <laughs> Hi. Um, the copyright page says that the FBI reviewed the, the book before publication. I wonder if you can talk about that process or, you know, do you wrangle over a word or a paragraph or anything like that or, if, or is it just a review just to check it? That's a, that's a good question. The, the FBI process is, is pretty straightforward. So I write the manuscript. Usually it's about, uh, the final product is I think around 85,000 words. I turned in close to 97, 98,000 words. 
and then they go through it. And mostly they're looking for, are you revealing anything that is classified, which I didn't, or anything that reveals a source or a method, which I did not. And then, um, you know, they, they say, okay, go, go forward, and then I can show it to an editor. And then the, the, when we're down to more or less the final 85,000 words, 230 pages, then um, they give you a letter and, uh, and it says it's, it's been reviewed. It's actually pretty smooth. It's usually within a month you, uh, you get it back. Uh, but they have their people go through it. And, uh, and actually, I, I would rather they do that. Because number one, I don't want to get jammed up. And number two, you can always uh, delete or, or take out something and, and just change it slightly. So, um, but it's, it's a pretty smooth uh, process. Yeah. Oh, he had a, he had a question. Um, because of Ramsey's uh, high level of intelligence, was he able to mask a lot of the nonverbal behavior that you were used to, that you were accustomed to in normal interviews? Yeah. Uh, great question. Was he able to mask because of his intellect? Uh, no. No. No more than than, for instance, when you emphasize, you arch your eyebrows for emphasis, right? So that's a gravity-defying behavior. We only do that when we're em uh, emphasize. You agree, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, you don't know that you're doing it. She knows it. I know it. But you don't realize you're doing it. He never realized his cigarette shook. He never realized how often he ventilated his neck or when he bit his lip or uh, when his skin would flush or uh, his lips would tighten. Um, you, you're just, no one in this room is that accountable to your own body. You just don't know it. I mean, the guy behind you is bouncing his leg and he's been doing it all, all night. <laughs> but, but that's his norm, <laughs> right? I mean, you, yeah, I mean, it's like a sewing machine. It's, uh, <laughs> just tie something to it. These are, these are things that you're not accountable for. But if you know what to look for and you know what it means, like he didn't know about pupillary constriction. When he saw the name Jeff Rondeau and his pupils constricted, you don't have, you don't know what your pupils are doing. But they constricted just enough, and um, and so yeah, that was uh, that was it. Thank you. It sounds like um, clearly the spies did it for the money. Did they ever express any remorse for betraying their country? So the question is, did they ever express regret? Uh, I cannot write big enough the words no. Now, having said that, uh, prior to Rod's sentencing, he did put together a document with his attorney to present to the judge where basically he was uh, being uh, apologetic. But I look at life and say, what did you do in the moment? What, what does your character do? There could have been heroes in this. The, the heroes, he could have been a hero when he was approached by Conrad. He could have turned him in. He could have been a hero. The other two could have been heroes. Kelly could have been a hero. But they didn't. They, the, the, the opportunity, you know, anybody can say I'm sorry. Anybody, that's self-reporting. The opportunity is way past. Here's the interesting thing. Any nation can afford to have a bank robbery or even a homicide. But just, you, you really can't afford espionage. You really cannot afford espionage because it can alter you know, everything from trade to lives to a nation's ability to defend itself. It's, it's the one crime you cannot really afford. Sir. Okay, so we can't afford it, but the Russians didn't invade, you know, so what did we really lose, you know? So, you know, if they didn't attack, 
you know, so we paid for your salary and a bunch of people to investigate, but, you know, what were the losses that, that, the, that all this espionage caused? But what have they had? No, don't don't just shrug. What if they had? Well, obviously that would be bad. Oh yeah, then that, that, that it would have been a bad day. <laughs> but they didn't. Stop right there. That's that's faulty logic. That was their decision. They could have made that decision at any moment. Think about the coup they had in '91, because the KGB was not going to tolerate all this freedom that was being expressed. What if they had said, "Let's wag the tail, or wag the dog, let's invade"? I'm sorry. I, I, I don't follow that channel. I, I, I just, I've, I've I've, I've, I have interviewed too many KGB defectors to, to go down that route. I, I, I just don't, sorry. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your presentation, Phil. Oh, you're welcome. Also, um, okay, when that note that you were saying, there was so much that they had uh, gotten their hands on mm -hmm. and revealed. So that his his idea that's the big picture. That's the the big wow. But um, there were probably lots of small things that that they did exploit, probably. And then the other thing is, did he go to jail? I mean, yes. And then uh, is he still in, or what happened to him? Yeah. After? So yeah, the the totality of uh, of what they gave away, I can never reveal. Because some things are just so so sensitive, and the the truth is that the other side, any hostile nation, can take advantage of that. But um, the, Ramsey uh, went to prison, as as did all of them, and if, and, and in fact, uh, even Kelly Church. Uh, one of the interesting things on, on Kelly Church, the uh, the government had had stipu stipulated with her that. You know, if, if she didn't accept a 25-year sentence, that um, she would face life. And uh, she wanted to fight that. And I'll never forget the superior court judge uh, who uh, brought her attorney over and said, would you tell your client that in this courtroom, life is life and that she will leave prison in a box? And then she, sa he, she said, step back and tell your client and everybody's legs buckled. It's a true story. It's like life is life. Um, Rod, I think, is out now. He served, um, he served uh, three-fourths of his uh, sentence, 30, 36 years, and uh, apparently behaved. And, um, and I think the others are out. What's, uh, what is interesting is Zoltan Zabo, who uh, remains in Austria, uh, I think is still receiving his uh, U.S. Army pay. Because, yeah, I know, it smells, right? Uh, because we were never able to convict him in court uh, here in the United States. So, but we, we got as many as we could. We have a young man in the front who, everybody that has just slightly less gray hair than me is a, is a young person. Probably the oldest person in the room. Um, uh, were you able uh, in later years to talk to your opposite number, uh, or not exactly your opposite number, but the KGB spy handlers? And, you know, as we know, many ex CIA and KGB people have gotten together and hashed over old times uh, about sure. the wars. Um, we did. We did. We, uh, we actually talked to the Hungarians who uh, had handled uh, all of this. You know, you have to remember, these are nation states. Uh, they're not just doing this on a weekend for the fun of it. These are nation states. They're professionals. They did what they were paid, uh, what they were paid to do. Um, from talking to them, we learned that um, many of them received uh, medals as a result of, uh, of their efforts. The Soviets were more than pleased, uh, truly pleased, with, uh, with the take they, they've got um, because it was unprecedented. Whole, uh, whole departments were set up to handle the, the, the documents and, uh, and so forth. Um, and, and there were, you know, I, I've always found it interesting. I've always found it interesting to, to talk to uh, 
uh, you know, the suspect and the intelligence service. I don't, I don't get emotional about it. It's, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, that's not my job. My job is, is to, um, to collect the, the, the facts. Um, one of the interesting things was that the day that Rod was arrested, people said, well, are you going to do the arrest yourself? And I, and I, I, I both myself and uh, Terry Moody said, uh, no, we're not going to do the arrest. There, there is no joy in this. There is no happiness in this. It's, this, is, this, is, this is misery. His, his mother suffered, his family, um, people's lives were, were placed in, in, in jeopardy. It's, I had done my job, and now I just wanted to distance myself. And that's, that's in part why it took me almost 30 years to write this. I didn't want to revisit any of this. I didn't want to revisit the fights with headquarters, with Washington field office, with other agencies. I had I had, had enough. But my, uh, a friend of mine came to me and said, do you know that most people don't know how perilous we came to that abyss? How close we came? And, uh, so I thought, well, um, it's, it's, it's time. And that's why you're here, and that's why I'm here. There's a gentleman. Uh, with your foot, do you think the uh, military will use this as uh, lessons learned for their insider threat program? Because in your presentation and discussion, uh, I didn't hear a reference of the lessons learned that they have within the Pentagon and also SHAPE. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, the lessons learned were actually learned a very long time ago. I, I'm not sure that they've been fulfilled, but we learned them. The, the permissive action link system had to be immediately changed. The, um, the authenticating system had to be changed immediately. Um, all sorts of changes had to access to the emergency action center had to be changed. Um, you know, is there, do they, do we always learn? We always learn, but do the bad guys always uh, come up with a different way to see things? Do they, you know, I used to be a criminal profiler, and one of the things that we were taught is think like a predator. Stop thinking like an FBI agent. The minute you stop thinking like an FBI agent, you stop asking the question, why? Why would you do that? Because the answer is, because I can. That's the predator. When you think like a predator, I can or I must, and then it's just methodology, then it's a totally different mindset. You, you don't have that moral or legal uh, barrier there. And uh, yeah, they, they, they've learned, but again, the, the, the problem will always be the human factor. The human factor. That, there are people in this room who have really high clearances. But most of them, you know, keep things to themselves. And, uh, and that unfortunately can, can change with the wrong person. Uh, any other question? Anybody, no, people in the back never ask. It's like junior high school. Uh, people in the back, they want to skip out early. No, oh, there's oh, another front. You, you shamed another front person. <laughs> uh, where did the prosecutions take place? So all the prosecutions, uh, so uh, that's a great question. The prosecutions took place in Tampa, and the reason they took place in Tampa was Rod lived there, and so that anchored uh, the um, prosecutions. They could have taken place here in Washington, but we had a very aggressive prosecutor who basically told the Department of Justice, oh wait, there's a child in the room, basically told the Department of Justice, no, we're going to run a grand jury, we're going to prosecute, and uh, you'll see it in the book. He said, we're going to paper the world with subpoenas, and if you interfere, we will charge you with uh, interfering with an investigation. And that was it. We had, finally, we had somebody that had courage to say this, this cannot go on. This just because we don't have all the, you'll never have all the evidence. You'll never have all the evidence. The Russians aren't going to give it to you. 
Are you kidding? So, well, you know, what, what were we waiting for? This should have, this should have been, he should have been taken down on the fifth interview. By then I had a confession from him. But it just went on and on and on. And, um, and so, but what did we get? We got Jeff Gregory, Jeff Rondeau, Kelly Church, and nobody knew any of these people were, were involved. She'll come back to you. She's got one uh, person. Got a dark person. Oh, well. <laughs> well, this all happened in between 85 and I guess 1991, but I feel like you're speaking in real time to the current situation um, with all the investigations into Russian contacts. Any comments on prosecution or how you might see that falling out? Well, what we always have, that's a great question. What the, the commonalities are that back then in the 80s, the Soviet Union saw the United States as the main adversary, right? The main adversary. And for whatever the reasons, and the, the, there, 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 there may be uh, some, it, it's just a matter of, of perspective. Um, Putin grew up in the nursery called the KGB. That's where he suckled. That was where he was reared. And the KGB trumpets psychopathy. The more things you can do and not be bothered by it, the better. That's the definition of psychopathy. And uh, so if, if we remain this enemy, right, Mitrokin, the Mitrokin archives, when he defected, he said nothing's changed. We had a name change. Um, if we're still perceived as, as the enemy, then we have to perceive, well, what what tools would that enemy use? The only ones that they can win. So they, they exercise war by other means, disinformation, theft of secrets, on and on and on and on. Um, but that's the history of the world. I mean, in the Bible, we start seeing espionage. I don't know if you know this. The, the reason that you know, ties are made in Italy now and not in China because Justinian I sent two monks in 500 BC to um, China to steal the technology. The, how do you make silk? You needed the mulberry bush and the little insect that, that does it. The silkworm, which they put in a concealment device called a staff, because it was punishable by death. And that ruined the trade balance between China and the rest of the world. I mean, China, this espionage has been going on for a long time. Do they remember it? Yeah. But I still buy my ties in Italy. <laughs> There's a, one more question. Yep. Thank you. You guilted me as well. <laughs> um, Yes, I did. Yes, I did. <laughs> but thank you for, for asking. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, through your story in the investigation, you introduced the idea of nonverbal communication serving a sort of key navigating point for you from the beginning till the end almost. Yeah. Uh, to what extent did and does the FBI look at nonverbal communication as a evidence or as an uh, investigative technique? To what extent they value this as a, as a key investigative uh, mechanism. So the question is, how does the FBI use nonverbals? It's nonverbals is the the primary means by which we communicate uh, between humans. You don't select a mate based on a resume or a curriculum vitae, how they smell, how they look, how they feel. It's all nonverbals. In the interview, in the theater of the interview, it's part of you know, you compare what is said with their nonverbals. But even before then, you know, how many cigarettes are they smoking before the interview? Did their skin flush? Why are they biting their lip? You're, these aren't evidence, but they're indicators. There's psychological discomfort. Well, what's causing it? 
So d does the FBI use it? Yeah, we use it, but you, you don't make a case on nonverbals. You certainly pursue the nonverbals. You know, I'm looking at this room and I'm reading everybody. It's like you can't turn it off. And, um, but, but that's because you're alive, you're communicating. You're either interested or disinterested, you're, you know, I've said a couple of things and, you know, I see the blink rates go up, okay. <laughs> that's fine. The, any other questions? I know it's, it's uh, getting late. Well, yep, one more. Oh, there's one, he one here. Yes, she, she did. And then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll finish up. I know a lot of you have to go. And then we have the books in the back. Yes, ma'am. Why did they do that? Do you, I mean, was it for money or was it because they wanted to, you know, bring out U.S. secrets and give them to others? They didn't. Money. Yeah. Why, why did they do it? It was all about money. Uh, Conrad earned somewhere around 2.2 million Deutschmarks in uh, 1985 uh, conversion. That's a lot of that's a lot of money. He was very well paid, very well paid. Um, he had gold Cougarans, um, and uh, it was all it was all about money, all about money. It wasn't you know belief in anything special. It was just. Well, listen, thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate you being here. Thanks to uh, the Spy Museum for hosting this. You guys have been terrific, and, and uh, people should really spend the time and look around here. The displays here cannot be found anywhere, except maybe at the CIA. But, but you I, can't get in there. But you can't get in there. But you can get you can get, you can get into the Spy Museum. And, thank you so uh, So thank much. you so thank very you, much. Joe.